Good morning. Okay. Um, who read the abstract for the for the keynote today? Okay, some of you. So, of those, some of you who read the abstract, who was a kind of uh, maybe a bit like, uh, what the fuck? What what is this? <laughs> At least some. Okay. So I can tell you a little story. How how come that it's uh, a little bit maybe off topic? If for a Python conference. So 15 years ago, I started studying physics and I met uh, Susanne, it's the keynote speaker of today, and we uh, became close friends until today. Um, and, <laughs> yeah. Um, who studied physics? More than have read the abstract, okay, so. Um, yeah, so I think all of us who uh, started to study physics, we have this tiny man in the head and he thinks, ah, yeah, 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 you will, you will become a professor in the end. It's, it's you, it's you. Uh, so fast forward 15 years later, it's not me, so I'm not a professor in physics, but Susanne became a professor in physics. Um, but it happened that I became uh, one of the organizers of a Python conference, the PyCon. So I said, hmm. Maybe revenge is uh, a too harsh word, but let's say um, I were able to rebalance some of the forces in the universe, so I called Susanne and said, Susanne, can you do me a favor, please? <laughs> Would you be uh, volunteering doing a keynote at a Python conference? Um, so, yeah, sorry for that. She's here today. Sorry. Um, <laughs> so... Um, yeah, uh, I think, uh, at least for me, it's a big win today. Um, I think for Susanne too. And uh, I'm absolutely sure it's also a big win for all of you. So welcome Sus uh, uh, Professor Dr. Susanne Mertens. Ah, wir sind schon da. Okay. So, thank you, Sebastian, for this nice introduction. Um, ah, here we go. All right. So, I hope this is not really a revenge. I wouldn't know what for. <laughs> anyway, so, um, I would also like to welcome you all to Karlsruhe. And... Um, there is some connections between Python and Catherine. For example, Karlsruhe is famous for hosting the PyCon in 2017, <laughs> but it is also famous for uh, its science experiments, and one of them is the so-called Catherine experiment. It stands for Karlsruhe Tritium Neutrino Experiment, and this takes place here at the Karlsruhe Institute of Technology. So, what is the connection between Python or uh, computing and science? It's quite obvious. Computing and programming tools are essential for science projects, and they will be even more so in the future as the science projects grow and uh, more data is acquired and so on. So um, just like I guess for you that you work in companies, you are using those programming tools to uh, tackle your challenges. We also need those programming tools to, to handle our data. But I have to admit, like Sebastian said, my talk will really focus more on the science, like on the motivation for using those tools, rather than speaking uh, exactly about uh, how we are using these tools because I'm more the expert on the science part rather than the programming part. But you can maybe consider this as kind of another motivation for developing all these nice tools. All right, so the Catherine experiment um, is an experiment to really look into the fundamental questions of our universe. These questions are, for example, what are uh, what is our universe made of, 
and how did like structures like our galaxy or galaxy clusters form. So we are really looking here into the yeah, very fundamental non-applied, uh, or maybe in the future, uh, questions. So let's look at this first question, what is our universe made of? And for this, we look into the background picture here, and what you see here is actually a very deep view into our universe. So here, the so-called Hubble Space Telescope looked onto one spot in the universe. You can think of like a tennis ball at a 100 meter distance. And it looked there for a total of 23 days, so a huge exposure time, so that enough light could be collected even from super far away objects. And these spots that you see here, they are actually not stars, but they are entire galaxies. And in this picture, about 10,000 galaxies were recorded. And of course, you know one of these galaxies quite well, and this is our Milky Way. And if we zoom in and we look at our Milky Way, you see, again, many spots, and these are now stars. And in our Milky Way, we have about 100 billion stars. And again, one of these stars uh, is quite known to us. Um, it's our sun, and of course our planet is going around the sun. And here, these are now the scales that we are more familiar with. You see here our Earth, and our Earth is inhabited by quite a few people, and some of them, you at least, know quite well. So <laughs> I only know him, know him since this conference. Uh, so, uh, and people actually, they are made of, I read like seven times 10 to the 28 atoms. I could imagine that he's probably made of some more atoms, <laughs> but this, this uh, is for 70 kilogram person, so probably a bit more. <laughs> so, sorry, this uh, d does not really, so uh, here is a, a kind of a magnifying glass, and you see here, one of these atoms, which is made of protons and neutrons and electrons going around. So why am I telling you all this uh, story? Because there is an astonishing fact. So everything, not only uh, Guido, but the trees, the planet itself, the stars, the gas between the stars and between the galaxies, everything is made of atoms. All matter, everything that we know is eventually made of atoms. But these atoms, they only make about 4% of the entire matter in our universe. So there is 96% of the matter in our universe where we basically have not even a clue what this could be. And therefore, we call it dark energy and dark matter. And basically, this is all we can say. Okay, there are some ideas, and you will hear about an idea of what this dark matter could be. Actually, dark energy is even more mysterious, and I will not speak about that. Okay, so atoms. So we said atoms, that's the matter that we know. But there is actually something more that we know and that I haven't mentioned. And it has to do with atoms. So an atom can actually decay. And you have all heard about radioactive decay. So some atoms, they are not stable, just like this Jenga uh, tower here, and they would spontaneously just collapse. And typically, so you would then think, well, sorry. So here is the atom, and you see here in uh, orange, this is a neutron, and it can spontaneously turn into a proton and then emit an electron. So here we have not introduced anything new. So if this was the whole truth, so now comes a bit physics, now you have to concentrate. If this was the whole truth, if really only an electron was emitted in this decay, we would expect a certain energy for this electron. So here you see a histogram that shows you how often do we observe an electron with a certain energy. So now, if only an electron was emitted in this decay, it would always carry the same energy. It would get the entire energy that is released in this decay. The fat, heavy atom would basically stay at rest and would just kick out this electron always with the same energy. So we would expect this 
we would expect to measure always the same energy for this electron. Now, this measurement was done, and what was found is that we measure many different energies for this electron. Sometimes, or rarely, it gets all the energy, but sometimes it gets little, and actually anything, any, uh, yeah, any possible energy for the electron was observed. So this was uh, one of the biggest mysteries uh, at that time, and people were really doubting the, the fundamental laws of physics. Basically, they were doubting that uh, energy conservation holds. But there came a person, an Italian physicist, and he had an idea. So actually, there was a conference, a physics conference, where he was supposed to present this idea, but the story tells that he was rather at some dancing uh, event with uh, some lady. So he wrote a letter to that conference, and in that letter, he writes, uh, it's in German, uh, dear radioactive uh, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to propose a new idea, namely that there is a new particle in the nucleus. There could be a new particle being emitted together with this electron. And this particle we call the neutrino. So if there are now two particles emitted, we can solve this mystery because the electron and the neutrino, they can share the energy, so sometimes the electron gets a lot, then the neutrino gets little, or they get almost the same, or sometimes the electron gets little and the neutrino gets a lot. So that explains how we can observe all these energies, all these different energies for um, the electron. So that was the birthday, basically, of the, this new, at this moment, still only postulated new particle, the neutrino. So now, but if Pauli is right, then in every radioactive decay, a neutrino would be produced. So you can imagine there are actually quite a few radioactive decays around us. For example, in every uh, nuclear power plant. So we have one here, like I think 60 or so kilometers away in Philipsburg. And you are sitting here now quite far away, you think. But if you think of a, like an area of this size, a square centimeter, every second from that power plant, 10 million neutrinos fly through your thumb every second, even though it's 60 kilometers away. And even more severe, if you think of the sun, which is a huge power plant, basically, a nuclear reactor, you uh, get 65 billions of neutrinos coming through your thumb every second. So many radioactive decays occur in the sun. And actually, there is also us. And here, this may have been at the last PyCon, I'm not sure. <laughs> I found you recognize him. <laughs> so, uh, and I, I assume that he knows everything. So here are some of the students I ask him, so how many neutrinos do we actually emit every day? And of course he says, well, we emit, even we emit a billion neutrinos per day. And this just comes because we, uh, we eat things that are radioactive, like banana, you may have heard of that. And they, uh, Ray, uh, make a radioactive decay and emit neutrinos, and with just all the mass that we have, we emit a billion neutrinos per day. All right, so why again do I tell you that? Because there is one, well, the, the source of neutrinos that supersedes everything is the Big Bang. So when the, basically the zero point of our universe, there was this big explosion, and in that moment, uh, I'd say infinitely many neutrinos were produced, and even though it's 13.6 uh, billion years ago, still from this moment, our entire universe is filled with neutrinos. So in each cubic centimeter, you find hundreds of neutrinos that originate still from the time of the Big Bang. Okay, so now you know that the world is full of neutrinos, everybody's emitting them, and even the entire space is filled with neutrinos. So you may wonder, why do I not know about that? 
or why do I not feel this? And the reason is that the neutrino is a strange particle. It really does not like interacting. It flies through everything. And to demonstrate that, this is an unrealistic example, but you would have, you would need to put 350 billion kilometer let between the sun and the earth, so more than there is space, in order to stop these neutrinos, in order to prevent the neutrinos from reaching the earth. So what you have to keep in mind, there are lots of neutrinos, but they don't like interacting. They are a little bit like ghost particles. Therefore, it took a long time before Pauli, so you remember Pauli who postulated the neutrino, it took 30 years for a group of people to come up with uh, some experiment to actually detect this particle. So this was in 1957 um, with the project Poltergeist here. And they, it was really called like that. And they had a detector that was called Herr Auge, so Mr. I. And um, so with that detector, the first neutrinos were actually observed. And uh, so they put the detector very close to a reactor, so where there were a lot, a lot of neutrinos. So they had a chance to detect one or two in uh, quite a long time. So this was then rewarded even later with the Nobel Prize. OK, but after this discovery, basically the neutrino fever broke out, and people built more and larger neutrino experiments. For example, this one here, and this is quite impressive. This is an experiment in Japan. It's huge, and you see this is a kind of a floating boat uh, like you have on your vacation. And on the wall of this uh, detector, there are photomultipliers. This is like cameras, and the whole thing's gonna be filled with water so that if one neutrino flies through this detector, it can make a reaction and a little light flash, which can then be recorded with these cameras. So after the discovery of the first neutrino, um, with these uh, subsequent experiments, it was found that there is actually not only one neutrino, one type of neutrino, but three types of neutrinos. And uh, the physicists, they call these three neutrino flavors, like strawberry, chocolate, and vanilla flavor, or electron, muon, and tau. So, there are three types of neutrino that was, uh, again, one of them was awarded with the Nobel Prize, one discovery. But there is even something more important than that, and which is very unique to these neutrinos, and that is that these neutrinos can change their flavor. So a neutrino, a strawberry neutrino, can turn into a chocolate neutrino, can turn into a vanilla neutrino, and back. So, and this is a super strange phenomena that has to do with quantum mechanics, and I will not go into the detail, but I would just like to mention that this was discovered um, in the 2000s, and this phenomenon is called neutrino oscillations, and this was awarded with the Nobel Prize in 2015, actually. So, the reason I'm, I'm mentioning this phenomenon is that it's very important for the rest of my talk, because it proves that the neutrino has a mass. It doesn't measure what the mass is, but it is a proof that it cannot be massless. So this phenomenon can only exist if neutrinos have a mass. Okay, and now I'm coming back to the very original question, what is our universe made of? So we saw that there are only 4% of the entire matter is atoms. And now you heard there are so many neutrinos in our universe. So even if they weigh only a little bit, they may actually contribute to the entire matter of our universe. So the question to determine with how much they can contribute to the matter in our universe, we have to understand what is the mass of the neutrino. So that is the big open question. We know it has a mass, but we don't know what it actually is. And beyond that, it's important to understand how 
heavy the neutrino is because it will influence how structures in the universe form. So you can imagine if the entire space is filled up with these neutrinos, they will kind of impact how things uh, collapse and how structures evolve. The quality here is unfortunately not so very nice. Okay, so the fundamental question now is, what is the mass of the neutrino? And uh, it's a difficult question because how would you measure something that just flies through everything? You cannot just take a neutrino, put it on a scale, and uh, weigh it because it would fall through the scale. So you have to kind of use a trick. And here we come back to um, the um, phenomenon that we looked at uh, in the beginning of the talk, namely the radioactive decay of um, an atom. And you see here again this uh, decay of the atom where an electron and a neutrino is emitted. And we saw that the electron has to share the energy with the neutrino, so sometimes it gets a lot, sometimes it gets little, and so on. They always share. And you can think of that like the decay provides a cake of energy of a fixed size. So sometimes the neutrino eats a lot, sometimes the electron eats a lot, and so on. And now comes the important point. The electron could never eat the entire energy cake. Why not? Because the neutrino has at least to exist, and that takes away so much energy from the electron that corresponds to the neutrino mass. So if we look at the maximum energy that the electron could get, it'd be nice to have a pointer, so at this point, here, at the very end, if we look at this very end point, you see the neutrino takes away at least the energy that corresponds to its mass, or with the equation E equals mc squared. So you see that um, if the neutrino had no mass, we would see this dashed line at the very end, and if the neutrino has a mass, the spectrum ends earlier because the neutrino carries away a little bit of the energy. So I hope you understand this point. So to measure the neutrino mass, we want to measure this decay extremely precisely. And for that, we use what we also call the most precise scale in the world, and that is the Karlsruhe tritium neutrino experiment. And here you see how uh, the big spectrometer of the Katrin experiment arrived in Karlsruhe, actually in Leopoldshafen. It's like 10 kilometers from here. Maybe if you have a free afternoon, you could maybe visit. I I'm not sure. You're probably busy. Yeah, <laughs> I'm not sure. It's worth visiting. If you ever come back to Karlsruhe, I recommend a, a visit of this um, quite impressive experiment. Um, so um, here, it's here at the Karlsruhe Institute of Technology. It's an international collaboration with 150 members from all kinds of institutes in the US and in Germany and other countries. And we want to measure the neutrino mass with the highest sensitivity that was ever reached. And this will take about three years of measurement time. Just this funny story that cannot be let out in a talk about the Katrin experiment. So you see this big tank was actually produced in Munich, which is about three, 400 kilometers from Karlsruhe. <laughs> but it was it was just too large to be transported on the streets because there are the, the highway bridges. So instead, it did this 8,000 kilometer uh, <laughs> track here, so down the Donau and then into all the seas, Black Sea, Mediterranean, up to the River Rhine on top, where it then was taken with a crane. Uh, and the last meters, they were then uh, this picture where it drove through the houses in, in Leopoldshafen. Okay, so yeah, that's the probably the largest uh, detour uh, that was made. <laughs> anyway, so how does Katrin work? So here again some physics um, that is actually easy to understand if, if you're interested. How does Katrin measure the, the, this endpoint, this uh, energy spectrum of the electron at the very end? 
So Catherine is using tritium, tritium as an isotope to look at the beta decay. So tritium makes this radioactive decay and emits an electron in red and a neutrino in yellow. So we have a lot of tritium. Um, in total, we are, so the reason why the experiment is here is actually because we have a tritium handling facility here in Karlsruhe. It could not have been anywhere else in Europe. So, and they are, have the, the permission to handle whatever 40 grams, I think, of tritium. In this source, which is about 10 meters long, this first piece here, we have about 30 micrograms of tritium. So it actually doesn't sound so much, but it leads to 10 to the 11 radioactive decays per second. And this is a huge number. So we get 10 to the 11 electrons produced per second. These electrons, they are then, uh, like on a railway system, they are transported with magnetic fields to the right, towards this huge spectrometer that was driving through the streets. And at the same time, all the tritium is removed because it's not allowed to be in the big spectrometer. Here we have an ultra-high vacuum, just like on the moon. So no atom is allowed in this big spectrometer. Then the electrons, they enter the spectrometer, and here we measure their energy. And this works by putting the spectrometer on a high voltage. You can think of this like in a mini golf. Um, the electrons, they enter the spectrometer and they can only fly through the spectrometer if they have enough velocity. Only the fastest electrons can make it through and hit the experiment, the detector which is put at the very end. So by we know the height of this mini golf hill, we can tell if an electron made it, it must have had more energy or more velocity than the height of this hill. So at the end, we can measure how many electrons hit our detector at the very end as a function of the height of this mini golf hill. That's the rough idea. And here you, uh, I'm gonna show you this in an animation. So you see here in yellow, the very end of the 70 meter long uh, setup and in blue is the uh, tritium source and here the green dots they uh, show the tritium molecules and they are inserted here in the center and then they drift to both ends of uh, the tritium source where they are pumped out again, recycled and then inserted again here in the center. And then sometimes you see these uh, red dots. I hope they appear here. Do we have one? Yes, here. This would be an electron that is guided along the magnetic field lines out of this tritium source towards the spectrometer, which starts here in green. At the same time, the, we have to get rid of the tritium. So you see here again in green the tritium, which is not allowed to be in the spectrometer. So we have huge pumps that take away that tritium. You see it here. And here we make a trick. We we'll guide the electrons around some chicane the electrons, they follow the magnetic field lines, but the tritium goes just straight because it's not charged and it can be pumped away. Here you see how the electrons enter the spectrometer. They go up this mini golf hill and only the fastest one can actually make it. So here you see one coming. I think this is one that will make it. Ah, yes. So it has enough velocity and it can make it over this potential barrier and is accelerated on the other side again and will hit the detector. And actually, uh, remember, we have 10 to the 11 electrons produced per second. Only one per minute will make it to the other end of the experiment. So if you were born as, a new, as an electron in the Catherine source, your chance of reaching the detector is like winning in the lottery twice. So it's really only a tiny fraction of those electrons that is interesting for us and that carries the information about the neutrino mass. So here you see that this actually exists. So all the components of Catherine are uh, here. So it starts with the gaseous tritium source. We have these huge pumping sections that remove all the tritium. And then uh, the spectrometer, we will look at that in a second more closely and the detector section in the background. 
So here, again, you see from the outside, now not anymore. So this is where it stands now. It's not any longer uh, in the streets. So, um, and what's important here is that we have these huge coils that go around the spectrometer and there are cables running with a current going through producing the magnetic field that guides the electrons through the spectrometer. So this is 10 meters, about more than 10 meters in diameter. And if we look on the inside, you can hardly see it, but I uh, can tell you that there are 24,000 micrometer thin wires in some distance to the walls that fine shape that electric field that selects the electrons, whether they can go through the spectrometer or not. So it's a huge effort. The building this took about 10 years. Okay, so this is all the hardware, but of course we want to understand this in detail. So we have to perform simulations. And what you see, oh, this is, sorry about the bad quality. On the left, you see a photograph of the Catherine spectrometer from the inside, and on the right, you see a simulation. So this entire thing has been simulated to an extremely good accuracy. And here comes one of the main challenges, computing challenges, that Catherine had to face. So the challenge is really that we have to combine very large dimensions, a spectrometer of 10 meters in diameter, with tiny structures of the order of micrometer, all these wires. So when we want to compute the, the fields, the electric fields in the spectrometer, we have to make meshes of very tiny sizes of micrometer, but at the same time, we want to describe this huge instrument. So we ended up discretizing the entire spectrometer into five million sub-elements. And with these five million sub-elements, you then have to solve these linear algebraic equations. So you have matrices that have the order of five million by five million, which of course doesn't uh, work. Uh, you cannot just invert that. It, it doesn't work like that. So you have to find smart algorithms that let you handle these five million by five million matrices. And we are using some iterative algorithms that iteratively find the solution to these equations. And in addition, we have to make use of some hybrid uh, CPU, GPU based uh, uh, computing algorithms, and of course run all of this on a parallel cluster. So in this case, for this simulation, this ran for uh, several days, I think 200 hours or something, on uh, some supercomputer in Lawrence Berkeley lab. So this, is, uh, quite, this was quite a challenging uh, computing, computing thing. But without that, we could not understand in detail how the electrons actually fly through the spectrometer. Here you see a result of that simulation from the perspective of the electron. So it enters the spectrometer. And you see here, unfortunately not so well, you see here all these wires so we fly through these three holes, they are pump ports. They're uh, uh, the well, residual gas is pumped out so that we achieve this vacuum. And here you see how the electron flies out again and then reaches the detector at the end. So this software is called uh, Cassiopeia. And <laughs> so I'm, I'm sorry, I have to say it's C and C++. Um, it's publicly <laughs> available. Uh, you can check it out there. It would be actually very interesting for me to understand if Python or if Python future would also be, uh, if it would be possible with a language like Python uh, to do these uh, really computing intensive uh, calculations that have to run on GPUs and so on. So of course we do not only simulate the electrons as they go through uh, the spectrometer, but we do it, do it also in real. And that happened in October uh, 14, 2016. And here the guys, they pressed this red button and that was the first light. That was the first electron traveling through the entire 70 meter long Catherine experiment. And actually it worked. So that was a huge success. We really uh, 
yeah, all the magnetic fields and electric fields were correctly set so that the electrons made it all the way through. Okay, these electrons unfortunately did not yet come from tritium, but I hope that in May 2018, maybe not the same people, but somebody will press again a red button and we will have the first electrons that come from a decay of tritium. So this will be the, the moment when Katrin starts taking data and then it will take uh, about three years to reach our sensitivity to the neutrino mass. So now, um, this is exciting. However, um, we know already something about the neutrino mass. We are not the first experiment who measures uh, or sets a limit on the neutrino mass. And from the current limits, we already know that the neutrino could not make those, could not be responsible for all the dark matter in the universe. It can make as much as atoms or slightly more, but it could not explain this entire uh, matter of our universe. Still, it is extremely important for uh, explaining how structures evolved. You remember that rotating picture? So for that, uh, the neutrino mass is still one of the most important input parameters that is unknown as of yet. But I want to, in the last uh, few minutes of my talk, I want to uh, mention a little bit the work that I'm, well, I'm involved in the Katrin analysis and uh, Katrin experiment, but we look a little bit beyond that already, namely into uh, a new particle. So you remember the title of my talk, Neutrinos, Who Are You? And if yes, how many? So this question is not yet fully uh, answered. Namely, there is the idea that there is a fourth neutrino. So we would not only have chocolate, strawberry, and vanilla, but there would be some kind of weird, and this already looks quite weird, like a, a new type of neutrino, and we call that a sterile neutrino. So this is a, an extremely topical field at the moment in neutrino physics. Many theorists postulate this, uh, the existence of another type of neutrino, and in fact, this neutrino could be heavier than the normal neutrino, and therefore it could fully explain the dark matter in our universe. But we don't know yet if this new neutrino exists or not. It's only postulated. And uh, so this is something that I'm working on, namely a new project that we call Tristan. So we want to use the Katrin experiment to search for this new type of neutrino, which could possibly be the dark matter of our universe. And here I show you a simple uh, image of how you could imagine that we can search for this with Katrin. So here, basically, uh, so you have to tilt your head, and this is again the spectrum of the energy of the electron, this spectrum that also Pauli that we saw in the very beginning. And I told you that at the very end, at the tip of this iceberg, we see a little distortion that will tell us something about the neutrino mass. But there is all the rest of the spectrum, and actually it turns out that a sterile neutrino could lead to a distortion further away from the endpoint. So you see, it would lead to a little kink in the spectrum. So the goal of this future project is to extend Katrin to look further away from these highest energies. And for that, we are currently building a new detector. So it will be a detector made of about 5,000 pixels. And here you already see some of the data challenges that will arise. We will collect uh, possibly more than a gigabyte of data per second by looking at all these electrons uh, from the entire spectrum. So currently, we have this is a photograph. This is uh, we are very proud. We have this prototype detector. It's not 5,000 pixels, but only seven. But we can do some quite nice tests with this prototype detector. For example, we brought it to Russia. And uh, why to Russia? 
So what's funny is that this picture on the top right is an actual picture of the uh, workshop <laughs> that they have there in Russia. It's at the same time a kind of a botanic garden and a kind of a shrine for <laughs> um, some Russians. Anyway, so the <laughs> the this so you see here a picture. This is the Troitsk experiment. So it's Troitsk is a city in in Russia. And it looks a little bit like Katrin, and that's true. It's like Katrin in small. It's the experiment that currently has the best limit on the neutrino mass. It's the predecessor of Katrin. So we got in contact with them, and we asked them if we could take our prototype detector and actually install it in this Russian experiment. And here you see uh, two students who take our small prototype detector this thing, this green thing here at the end, and we installed it into the Russian experiment. And the Russians, they still have tritium. Remember, Katrin only next year will have the first tritium. The Russians have tritium already, so we were first, and we could measure our first tritium spectrum with uh, this Russian experiment. And here, this is actually data and some super preliminary uh, fit to our tritium spectrum. And the analysis is ongoing. And of course, this involves many steps that you may also know from your data analysis. So of course, you get the data in whatever format. So there will be first some data processing step to bring it into a format that you can handle the data. There will be some data cleaning step so to make sure that all the data meet certain quality criteria and yeah, uh, define good runs, bad runs, uh, bad events, and so on. In physics, very important, the data calibration. So we have to, on the x-axis, you see here energy, but this is not originally energy, so we have to rescale everything to make it into physical quantities. And then the step number four, the most interesting, as I find, is the, f the fit to the model, so we have the measured data, and now we take a theoretical um, prediction and we compare our theoretical prediction to the data. And by that, we can extract if there may be a sterile neutrino in the data or not. So this is the last step where we get the physics out. And so this data analysis is ongoing at the moment, and we do this in Python. So I have to say here that um, the younger students in physics, they, are, they love Python. So um, it's really a generation thing. So the, the earlier ones, they, it was really Fortran. Then uh, it kind of, it's always some delay, I think, <laughs> between industry and science. So when industry was already using C and C++, physicists were doing Fortran. Then they realized, OK, C++, that's the thing to do. Now everything is rewritten in C++. And now Python is, I think, the, the next uh, stage. So the younger, the PhD students nowadays, they really look into how to use Python. And um, of course, uh, the interesting libraries for us, I think I heard it even in the introduction, there is NumPy, SciPy, the matplotlib, this is uh, for the plotting. And this is, of course, uh, yeah, there are all the functions that we need, the fitting algorithms, the minimizers, uh, operations with vectors and matrices and so on. So this is extremely important in the physicist's life. Also the tools. So here I would like to mention this Jupyter. This is something that you would see on every uh, computer of a PhD student. It's just so easy to calculate and you get your plot out and just as you go, you have kind of almost your report written um, on, on, on the topic that you're working on. So these are tools that, that we use, of course, also, for example, my students using the Anaconda, and we are using Git. But I would say when we think of the large scale, like the final analysis where we have these gigabytes of data and so on, so my feeling is that um, probably some parallel computing will be essential. And so I was talking to my students before, and so they are curious to look into the options that we have with Python for parallel uh, computing and handling these mass massive amounts of data. Okay, so with that, I would like to summarize what I told you. And uh, the first point was, I hope I could convince you that the neutrinos are key to understand some of the fundamental things about the universe. 
for example, what it is made of and how the structures evolve. For that, we need the catching experiment. We need to know the neutrino mass. So catching is designed to measure the neutrino mass, and it will start data taking next year. And then uh, catching equipped with a new detector, so that's this project that I'm working on, this Tristan project, has the potential to even not only measure the neutrino mass, but to search for this new type of neutrino, the sterile neutrino, which could maybe be dark matter. And our first data, we are using Python to, to analyze. So, and I'm not yet done. Um, so by talking to Zebi and some others, I thought that, so this is a super vague idea, but I thought it may be interesting to have kind of some science industry exchange because there are two motivations for that. So I feel like in physics, we are sometimes lacking behind in knowing about the state of the art of all the tools that there are in programming. And maybe some of you have studied physics before and they still find it interesting, but they switch to, um, switch to industry and don't have the contact to these fundamental problems anymore. So maybe there could be a common interest in as physicists learning from you the, the latest technology and the best way to, do, uh, to write a code. And at the same time, you may be curious to contribute to some science project. So um, this could be a meetup group, it could be a little workshop, it could be something else, I don't know. So if you find this interesting, I'm happy if you would contact me. I'm, no, but I'm not yet done. <laughs> okay. Just like the idea. Okay, yeah. Anyway, I wanted to close, so I wanted to come back to what is actually the connection between Catherine and uh, Python, and so I want to stop with this, leave you with this picture that some of you may know. So this is obviously not a hat, but it's a Python that's digesting the Catherine experiment. <laughs> so. Hello. Does this work? Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I, I think I was right. So it was a great win. So I really uh, enjoyed it uh, for both things. Uh, for the, yeah, uh, you know it. Um, I think there are questions. This was super clear. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. Okay, so I have a question. Mm -hmm. Can you go back some slides to the <laughs> Troy, Troika? Troisk? No, uh, uh, more? Mm -hmm. No, no, no. More? 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 Ah, okay, maybe it's... Uh, okay, I can do it. <laughs> is this you? Ah, uh, no. This is a female technician who was working. Uh, so this is inside the Catherine experiment. So these 24,000 wires had to be installed uh, inside the Catherine experiment. So we were always dressed up like this. I... Actually, I was helping with this, so I was also dressed up like this, but the photograph is from some technician, uh, Nancy. More questions of that quality. <laughs> <laughs> there is one. Uh, hi, uh, thanks for your talk. Uh, I was just wondering what the uh, mixing mechanism would be, look like now? Are there constraints through mixing of what the fourth neutrino can look like, or is it, is it actually just fine? So, um, so, okay, so that sounds like a real physics question. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, the sterile neutrino, let me, where is this? So the sterile neutrino is called sterile neutrino because it interacts even less with matter than the normal neutrino does. So it's basically, so we call the normal neutrino active neutrino and uh, the, this new type sterile neutrino. So its interaction strength is the one of the neutrino times at least 10 to the minus six. So a million times less than a normal neutrino. So that you can think of in this radioactive decay, 
we have 10 to the 11 decays per second, and only at most every millionth decay we would produce this sterile neutrino instead of the normal neutrino. So you can think of it like this. And of course, finding something that only happens in the millionth, so yeah, in every millionth time, the signal will be extremely small and extremely hard to find. We are only lucky because we have these many decays, 10 to the 11 per second, so there's a chance to get some that go into this uh, new type of neutrino. So the mixing, the mixing, so where was the question back there? So for this type of sterile neutrino that could be the dark matter, the mixing, so basically the interaction with the normal matter is at most 10 to the minus six times the interaction of the normal neutrino. Yeah, non-physics question, but yeah. uh, you mentioned that uh, um, you would be very likely to see um, Jupyter notebooks um, open on the computers yes. of, of every PhD student. Yeah. How does that uh, change your work, if you can already um, say that? So is there also a tendency going into reproducible science with the data along with the, um, with the algorithms for analyzing it and the paper is published together? Okay, I would say... We it may not be the paper that would come out of that, but it's extremely useful to have some kind of report. So when in meetings somebody would report on what he has done, it can come with uh, basically a copy of that notebook and we can follow along like this. So it, it's, I'm very jealous because I don't have it on <laughs> my computer. So I think it's, it suits very well the, the kind of work of a physicist. Okay, here's a question. Hi, my question is more on the three flavors of neutrinos you mm -hmm. mentioned, and you said that the three flavors are interchangeable and that's only possible if they have mass. Yes. I could not understand why that would yeah, be. Yeah, yeah, because that's complicated. <laughs> <laughs> um, it would be nice to have like a one sentence to make this uh, plausible. I give you a hint, but it won't, I don't think. Can. So the neutrinos, they come in uh, different flavors, but they also come with different masses. And a neutrino that has a certain mass does not have a specific flavor. And a neutrino that has a specific flavor has not a specific mass. And that's quantum mechanics. So the eigen, so they are not simultaneously, we, you cannot simultaneously say this neutrino has a certain flavor and therefore it has this mass. So now when something, when the neutrinos um, travel, for example, from the sun to the earth, what really travels is the neutrino that has a certain mass. So because something that flies around that I can catch must have a mass. But this thing has not a specific flavor. So when it comes to Earth, I have basically a different probability to observe it, to observe it with a strawberry, chocolate, or vanilla flavor. So the key is that mass and flavor are not the same. Perfect explanation. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's, that's really hard. I mean, that, yeah. yeah, quantum physics is hard. I can, I can support that. More questions? One, two, okay, so first one, what's Thank you for the presentation, it was so interesting. Um, I was thinking then uh, maybe the sterile neutrino could be fine in the spectrum of the electron that is the less energy. And I saw from the curve uh, that the energy of the electron start from one value is not close to zero. So uh, maybe this energy could be related to this sterile neutrino. Hmm, uh, so I think you're, you're partly exactly right. So uh, the sterile neutrino, we can find it in the energy spectrum of the electron. Exactly, that's what we are trying to do. So you see that if there was a sterile neutrino, it would, dis oops, it would distort the energy spectrum of uh, the electron. 
and you can understand this actually. So, this. So, I told you the ele the electron and the neutrino they have to share the energy. Now, if in every millionth of the decays we produce the electron together with this new type of neutrino, the electron has to share the energy with this new type of neutrino, and this is much heavier. So the electron can only get a much reduced energy. So this is a kind of a, an additional uh, branch that underlies this spectrum. And if we take the two cases together, we get a kink. I'm sorry. I don't think this was uh, understandable for everybody. <laughs> yeah, you, you're still here until one, one o'clock. So if you have any questions, you can so also... So in uh, fact, this is not maybe, hard to understand. Maybe just the last question here, I think. And also, yeah, so last question here. Hey, uh, will the data collected from Catlin be open source at some point so we all can look at it or? Yeah, maybe two comments to this. So um, from discussing with uh, some of you, I heard that uh, LIGO, who, who gave a talk at the last, last PyCon, uh, or to EuroPy. Ah, yeah. So um, they did that. So they opened at least some of their data to the public, and uh, it was all Python-based, so everybody could kind of uh, do the analysis on his own and understand the, the LIGO. The LIGO was the experiment that won just now the Nobel Prize for discovery of gravitational waves. So I find this a very great idea, and we should do something like that on the public outreach level. And eventually, if you ask me, I think that, of course, we should also uh, make all data uh, publicly available. But I don't know exactly what the policy will be. But as a public outreach project, I think this would be really great. OK, so she's still around. If you have some questions, just approach her. And let's speak Susanne again, uh, Pro Professor Dr. Susanne Mertens again. <laughs>